But fictive ethic in the end means, yes, no, the norms and values which each one of us has, actually they go down their human fictions. They are made up by us. I think we're getting to your Nietzschean background here now. It, it seems to me that to justify the kind of research you're proposing, you would need an almost dogmatic mm -hmm. level of certainty in the other direction. Hi, we're those two priests. I'm Father Michael, and I'm here with Father Andrew, and we're so excited to have a special guest today. We're with Professor Stefan Lawrence Sorgner, and he is a professor at John Cabot University, which is a unique reality, right? It's an American university in the heart of Rome, right by Trastevere. And your passion, your great love, your interest intellectually is transhumanism, this fascinating world that our viewers know I care deeply about. So I'm so excited to have a meaningful conversation about this. I'm sure coming from different perspectives, but exploring what this new contemporary movement means for us. Now, we are really in for a treat today because I have this ridiculously long, impressive uh, summary of your work. So I just want to highlight some of your accomplishments. I mentioned that you're at John Cabot University as a professor. You're the director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network. You're a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, a research fellow at the AYU Institute for the Humanities. Um, you're also an advisor of Humanity Plus, right? This is a, a new uh, position that you have. And you have quite a few impressive publications, uh, Metaphysics Without Truth. Uh, you have On Transhumanism, from a few years ago with Penn State University Press. The work that we're gonna focus on today, one of your most recent works from 2022, is we have always been cyborgs, right? And I think we really wanna unpack this, right? A great provocative title. Um, we have always been cyborgs, digital data, gene technologies, and an ethics of transhumanism. So we're gonna need some time to unpack that, but uh, Stefan, thank you so much for coming out, and tell us about this work uh, that you've spent some time on. Yeah, many thanks for that really kind introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure um, being here and continuing our discussion, which we already started during the conference. And yeah, we've always been cyborgs. It's really sort of a, it's an introduction to transhumanism, but I'm also presenting my own specific take. On, on these related issues. So it, it also shows the diversity of different transhumanist approaches because very often transhumanism is associated solely with sort of analytical utilitarian philosophy, just with an idea of, you know, us turning into, into, into special, it's an upgrade to humanity, humanity plus, no, it, us, us becoming renaissance, perfection, ideals, like Superman on Viagra or Wonder Woman with Botox. That's sort of the media representation of transhumanism very often. It's a very stereotypical representation, which I, I don't think has anything to do with sort of the great diversity of different approaches, um, which are being, which you can find in the discourses in transhumanism, in particular also in the ones which, are, which should be taken more seriously intellectually in universities because I think very often sort of what you get to see in what what you get to see in some of these documentaries or in some newspaper articles are sort of some 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 leading voices, some entrepreneurs, computer scientists who've done something exceptional. Silicon but they don't, Valley gurus. Silicon Valley gurus, but they don't really give a good appropriate um, description of what transhumanism really is approach. So yeah, we've always been cyborgs has, has got two different elements. Um, which I'm trying to highlight. The cyborg element is sort of, a, it's a new anthropology mm. and it also stresses that we don't have to be so afraid of transhumanism because it's really in tune of what we've always been doing as human beings. Mm. So cyborg in ancient Greek comes from Kubernetes, orc, organism, so, uh, and, and Kubernetes stands for the helmsman, the steers person of a ship, and yeah, so it's a steered organism. We've always been steered organisms. And, and thereby I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting, so it's where do we get our rationality from? Mm. Where do, how do we acquire language? Mm -hmm. and, 
And what I'm showing here is sort of 300,000 years ago uh, when Homo sapiens came about according to um, the latest study. So it sometimes changes 100,000 years early, later. Now it's once normally said it's, it's about, it took place about 300,000 years ago. So there was, the, it, the, it seems that there was a genetic mut mutation which took place at the time, which was sort of the prerequisite for us developing language. And then and we, we steadily developed the capacities, the environment, the parents, upgraded us with language. So it's nothing which came from somewhere outside, but it is something it is sort of the process which took place as a parental upgrade. We get altered. Because when we are born, we don't speak. No, we don't have a language. So we have to learn and develop. We have to learn and develop it. And that's what our parents tell us to do. That's what the environment enables us to do. And so and the entire education process is a steering process. We get further upgrades. We learn history, we learn mathematics, physics, and then eventually now we've reached a time where we've got the possibility to change who we are by means of gene technologies, by means of brain-computer interfaces, eventually maybe by means of digitalization as well. So, but this is a way to show, well, if, if this is how we, we became human beings. Can I ask you a question there? Yes. Because um, I'm glad to be the ignorant one in the room today. Um, I'm not a specialist in transhumanism I, from a Catholic perspective or any perspective. So it allows me to kind of play the middleman here quite literally today and ask questions. But you, you mentioned that there's a new anthropology here. And so I'm just wondering, before we can talk about being transhuman, something beyond human, um, what would you say is the definition of what makes man man? I just from our perspective, we're, many of us here in school, the typical definition of a rational animal. Is there something different that you're looking at when you talk about um, what makes man man? So here, once you take that understanding and you see that basically our capacity of, of, of being able to speak, to communicate, mm -hmm. is part of something external, is part of an upgrade process, that means sort of, yeah, we, we gain rationality. Rationality has to do with the use of language. Sure. But it's not the unified rationality. It's, it's a specific rationality uh, which each one of us develops individually. There's an idiosyncratic rationality in you and you and me right. and in each one of us. It was this, it's really a shift away from the platonic tradition where, where we've got one specific rationality to which all of us have access Okay. which presents our human nature that's undermining an essentialist conception of human nature. Okay, so you don't have an essentialist, uh, there is no essence there's of no man. Essence uh, each, man. Each one is utterly yeah. individual in a radical sense. <sighs> individual, individual means it's indivisible. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't even say so it's indivisible. Okay. We're, we're, we're so divisible in many different aspects um, and we're permanently changing in all different aspects. It's a, it's a permanent becoming in all aspects at each moment. There is no, so this is really, it's undermining a, a strong essentialist account. There's everything turns into, turns into becoming. Well, so I, I'm sure we would eventually quibble with this denial of a human nature, a human essence, but I think you're touching on something that's, that resonates with the Catholic tradition, which resonates with certain philosophical traditions like the Thomistic tradition that many Catholics are familiar with in the sense that we see a fundamental continuity between the human being and other animals. We're very aware of our embodiedness, we're very aware of our uh, sense life, of these parallels that we find, and a certain gradation in the visible world and, and real similarities and we also recognize very much this whole process of, of growth and development, right? We don't hold to just this set of uh, innate ideas that, that kick in the moment uh, uh, of, our, of our creation, the moment we begin, right? But there's that sense of this tremendous potency that then becomes actualized and that requires the assistance of a lot of other factors, including a community, a family, a society, right? We're very embodied and embedded within our community and we're conditioned by that community and we're, we're dependent on that community and we receive and are formed through that. So 
I, I would certainly be comfortable acknowledging all of that dynamism and that development, but I, I would see a lot of that as actualized potency that itself is grounded in a certain stable human nature, but not a static, fixed, determined human nature that leads to this kind of bland uniformity, but a dynamic human nature. I mean, if, they give even, even you go back to some of Aquinas' sources, like Aristotle, who I don't think is infallible, but it, making this fundamental distinction between a first and a second nature, between that which is given and an intrinsically purposeful kind of being that has certain functions and ends, but that through free choice is formed one way or another, is formed well through virtue, is formed poorly through vice, right? So is there room for a, a dynamic essentialism, right? Because I know that there, I, at the conference I went to, you, you, you helped to organize a wonderful uh, transhumanist uh, and art conference recently that I attended, and I know that there were a lot of critiques of essentialism and a fear of a static notion of human nature, a fear that this was going to be an exclusivistic perspective that would keep certain people out. And I recognize that historically that's been an issue, but I wonder if there's not another approach that can combine both a nature and a dynamism, a development, a change, an evolution, and certainly improvement, whether that's through education or more strictly technological uh, means that people talk about today. So, so what I'm presenting, if you talk about sort of epistemological understanding, what is the validity, what is the grounding of such an understanding, I would say, well, it's, it's, it's a, what I'm presenting are suggestions. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's not, again, not an essentialist, it's not a foundational, there's no foundational criteria by means of which I could, I could demonstrate Mm -hmm. um, and justify sort of that understanding. Yes. Um, so and there's always the openness for an essentialism. I couldn't. There's no possibility to 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 exclude the possibility of an essentialism. That's that's very important. Right. Um, the problem is whether it's needed such an essentialist understanding. And given on given sort of the insights, empirical understanding, the scientific judgments which we have, even. Theological, I would say, maybe maybe such an essentialism is not even needed for 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 for, for Catholicism. Um, the deep sort of the, I'm curious, as a theologian um, in the crowd, I don't want to, so what's yeah. the theological um, inclination away from essentialism? I'm curious. What would Father be? Andrew's a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, that's this strong ontological basis. I mean, so, sort of the gradual, I'm glad that you, you referred to Thomas Aquinas, um, because in a way, in particular when it comes to notions such as personhood, um, I, I think he's, he's, he, he's held this dynamism. No? There was like this gradual animation which, which took place initially, sort of, you know, maybe that, the animation of, of plants, of animals, and finally only the rational soul which gets connected with the human body, which takes you in know, place quite, quite a long time after fertilization, mm -hmm. according to, to what Aquinas sort of has suggested, you know, like two months, maybe three yeah, months, sort of depending on... It's too. a gradual, gradual ensoulment. And, and that's, that's the embryology, obviously, that we have today. In, uh, so, and that, that has a lot of issues when we talk about bioethical issues at the beginning of life. So Thomas Aquinas, with such an understanding mm -hmm. of animation, would have been, could have been quite open concerning a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. That's speculation, but there are good reasons for, I guess, for... For, for claiming that, you know, it's, maybe one should investigate further, sort of go back to what Thomas Aquinas has suggested as one of the issues when we deal with bioethical topics and, and possibilities concerning IVF, in vitro fertilization, right. gene editing, and so on. Right. And I guess we might talk about that a little bit later. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, as, um, as, as you know, my most recent research, my doctoral dissertation, uh, some publications that I've put out recently in a book I'm working on, is very much focused on bringing the Thomistic tradition with a focus on virtue ethics, right? With this focus on the notion that we can and we should freely develop ourselves and better ourselves, uh, placing that tradition in dialogue with transhumanism. Now, I chose uh, to focus on thinkers associated with the University of Oxford, 
And I know full well that they're not the only thinkers and they don't represent um, all transhumanist thought, but I did want to be fair to at least one group and not overgeneralize. Uh, so I'm fascinating with, with the, the parallels and the, the dialogue between this, and I think there's such a value in maintaining a human nature, but with that dynamism and that development, and uh, this would be a whole series yeah. of, of talks and, and YouTube uh, episodes, right? But what I found in some of these transhumanist thinkers is precisely because they lacked any kind of clear teleology, sense of finality or purpose within a common human nature, it seemed that very logically they came to this sort of radical morphological freedom that it seems like you want to resist, and I'm glad to hear that, which I think ends up leading to a kind of societal chaos, right? Each person is left to very autonomously decide how to use potent technology and is left to autonomously decide how to use very potent technology on vulnerable future generations, right, embryos and, and others. And it seems like if we don't really have a common human nature, it's very difficult for us to, to navigate and begin to assess which enhancement actually contributes to human betterment and which might actually inhibit human benefit. I'm not saying that the practical, concrete decisions of each and every technology are easy to make, because I certainly don't think that suddenly the Catholic Church can give us this easy recipe of how to use every biotechnology. I just, I, I find it difficult, and I'd be really interested to hear your take on this, I find it difficult to even begin that, that, that hard process of assessing individual interventions if we don't have that kind of compass, that sense of this is good for the human person or not good for the human person. Do, do you Yeah, yeah I, see, I see what you get. Um, the thing is, I don't think sort of that essentialist understanding is even necessary for having a compass. You know, if you just go back to Jesus in the New, New Testament, if you just go back to the virtue of love, mm -hmm. um, isn't that sufficient as a compass for how to engage with other persons? how to treat other person. So as long as you do it out of love, then this is, is a good moral justification for doing so. Well, you and know, the, the typical way of describing love from a Thomistic point of view would be to will the good of another, right? So there's this notion built into the idea of love that there is a telos, there is, uh, there is a proper good that it, that it corresponds with one's pur purpose as for which they are made. Yeah. But if you, if you do away with such a teleology, the very notion of love would seem to dissolve. I, I, at least that would be my understanding. You want to respond to yeah, that? Yeah, but one doesn't have to take over the Thomistic notion of love in that circumstance. You know. mm -hmm. it, there could be a different understanding of love, so which could be said sort of in tune with... So why, for example, the processes of the Enlightenment which took place, um, couldn't that be seen as sort of the process of the Enlightenment which lead to an ethics of autonomy? sort of diversity of different decision-making, if that was connected, sort of seen as a, as, a, as a kenosis, as a weakening process, the entire history of the world, sort of God creating, creating the world, entering into the world, was Jesus Christ entering into the world, and then from the rigid laws of the Old Testament, just entering, moving towards a, a, a virtue of law, of ethics, then sort, sort of the liberal ethics of liberal ethics of autonomy on the basis of the virtue of law sort of would be part of that weakening process of the entire history and that could still be seen as in tune so here the ethics of ethics of autonomy liberal ethics of autonomy could be fully seen as in tune with the preachings of Jesus Christ of the New Testament maybe as a realization of these teachings Okay. Do you see, so I, I see the general uh, gist, but I, I'm not understanding what the definition of love would be on that model. What what does it mean? If it doesn't mean to will the good of the other, what what does it mean? Well, it's a dedication. It's firstly an avoidance of direct harm, which is central, and and a caring process for the other person, but without necessarily having some specific um, sort of content in mind. So it would in the end have to be. Uh, communication with one's with one's conscience in our where where sort of the limitations are 
and what this care and, and what this non-harming directly implies. And this would always also has to take into consideration this, the cultural and societal circumstances and here some, some more flexibility. So it's not the possible, I don't think one can make a judgment which is eternally valid what exactly that love and care implies. Mm -hmm. um, but one has to be this openness and flexibility in the, in the, in the, in the specific circumstances. What is sufficient is the reference is sort of the acknowledgement of the law, which I think might be, might just be sufficient for doing so. So, so I'm all about love, okay, we're, we're all about love, right? Big, big fan of charity, a uh, very important chief uh, virtue in, in our Christian yeah. lives, our yeah. Christian tradition, right? Um, I, I suppose that the, coming back a, a little bit to my concern, uh, if, if, the, if I'm understanding you correctly, and that that love is contentless, yeah. it seems as though uh, any individual making a, a major decision regarding genetic engineering, uh, regarding different forms of enhancement, it could be pharmaceutical, it could be biotechnical, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. making that decision with this kind of contentless notion of love could come to a radically different and even contradictory decision from another person or another country. Mm -hmm. And it would seem that that would bring us into a, a conflict of interests that ultimately cannot be resolved, at, at least not resolved in a, in a rational way, right? So from the perspective of, you could say, essentialism here, or at least the version of essentialism we're talking about, uh, as you know well, we have this notion there's a natural moral law and all people, no matter their ethnic background, no matter their uh, financial status, no matter their political influence, they're all held to this common standard as being part of the same human family and the same metaphysical kind, if you will, even though they might look and act radically differently and have lots of wonderful cultural, culturally diverse uh, ways of living and expressing themselves. There is that kind of common standard and that common direction that would allow us to begin arbitrating between these decisions, whereas without that, I fear, and maybe there's some alternative I'm missing here, I fear that we're left with this contentless love and a sort of clash of power. In the end, who wins out? Whose definition of love wins? Whoever's stronger, whoever has more political influence, whoever has more grant money. It, it, do you see my, my concerns? No, I, I do see the concerns, and these are really valid concerns. I think many of the social justice issues are really some of the most pressing issues when it comes to technological challenges in society. If one interpreted the law then from a, from a, from a Catholic perspective, one could always take a reference in the Bible, and, and you see sort of the parable of talents, for example. You know, what happens there is sort of the, the one who, who, who hides the talents um, in the crown is the one who gets punished, who's not getting the reward, but you know, the one who's using the talents and the, the, that gets further support. And that's sort of, it seems to me, a clear indication that's actually a praise of transhumanism. Now, you should use your talents because all the technological innovations we've realized, these are clear talents. Now we can right. realize something, achieve something. Which, which we haven't been able to do before. And we can, and there's so many 120 year olds in, in the Bible, there's Methuselah, right. you know, much older. <laughs> exactly. So in particular, for life some, extension. <laughs> in particular, for something for, I wouldn't say life extension, I would rather say the so extension of the health span, which okay. really makes a significant difference. Yes. Yeah. Oh, unpack not, that for me. This is Yeah, because we don't want to just be in our bed for decades, arriving in pain and suffering. Yeah. We would want to have a certain standard of life and we want to be able to pursue our interests and goals and service of others. So I think you bring up great points yeah. and I can't remember whether we actually stopped and started to unpack what transhumanism is because I'm having a blast nerding out on transhumanism with you and I could do this for hours, but especially for the sake of our viewers who maybe haven't nerded out as much as we have about these issues. Uh, you do a very good job in the first chapter of this book, you know, we've always been cyborgs, of giving us a, an overview, a perspective. And I also really appreciated your work because you capture the nuance and the differences between different transhumanist thinkers. Like I focus very much on the Oxford School. 
I'm familiar with some of the proposals coming out of Silicon Valley, which I don't see as being as philosophically serious, but certainly fascinating. Um, so can, can you just help us enter in, like when you say you, you want to support transhumanism, you're, you're appealing to improvements in, in health, in uh, the, the health over a longer period of time, which I think is fairly non-controversial, certainly in Catholic circles would be non-controversial. So I think it would just help our dialogue if you can unpack better what you mean by transhumanism. Because I told you beforehand, I've seen in a lot of my fellow Catholics a negative tendency to demonize transhumanism and to jump right away to these apocalyptic scenarios or to talk about kind of conspiracies that are going on to, to destroy humanity. And I don't think you're the spawn of Satan, uh, but <laughs> if you are, just let me know. <laughs> I didn't read it in the same day. Well, one has to have... So it's the use of technologies in order to move beyond the current personal boundary. That's sort of what, what all transhumanists can't affirm. Uh -huh. um, they want to... Why, why do they think this is in our interest? Why do, you think, do they think it's in the interest of persons? Well, by moving beyond these boundaries, we achieve, we develop capacities which usually increase our chances of living good lives. And that's sort of the, the fundamental motivation around it. Now, we want to in, in, improve our capacity, our likelihood of living good lives. And, and this is sort of without having one specific notion of the good life in mind. So the openness concerning... Uh, great variety of different notions. It's pluralistic. Just very pluralistic. There is no, there is not one notion of the good life which is necessarily connected to, to transhumanism. There are Mormon transhumanists, Catholic transhumanists, there, there are atheists, there are transhumanists, there, there are so many different shades of transhumanism. But that's sort of the core um, to which all of them can agree with. Right. The one thing which, so, um, there's no clear understanding of the good life to which all of them agree. There's maybe one element, and I think that this is really something, and you've, you've already mentioned that, so sort of it's the increase of the health span. So the, most, most transhumanists agree, well, it is in personal interest if we live longer and if we long, live longer healthily. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you, if, we, if we make a sort of a questionnaire and we ask, Maybe it's not 100% to identify with a longer, a longer health span with a better quality of life, but, you know, more than 90%. And there are psychological studies to actually confirm this. You know, the great majority of people think if they live longer healthily, it somehow improves their quality of life. It could be an intrinsic improvement in the sense of just by being healthy, it, it, it's already something which makes you live better. Mm -hmm. um, it could be instrumentally right. um, relevant, sort of, you need I, I to be healthy. We can more classes, we can do more YouTube episodes, exactly. we can write more books, we can <laughs> perform more acts of charity. The longer we live, the healthier we are, the more energy we have. For example, I mean, all example, of that yeah. sounds exactly. really great, and I hope we don't have any viewers opposed <laughs> to that. I mean, if, if they are opposed to that, go ahead and write us a comment, yeah. and you know we'll try to infect you with some sort of disease or something like that to help you. But it, oh, so that sounds wonderful, yeah. right? And I'm all on board. But it, is there something else that distinguishes transhumanism? Is there because what you're describing, I think, especially to people less familiar with the movement, might sound like medicine, it might sound like the education, it seems like, okay, yeah, we, we've been doing that for a while, and are we, would you say that there's an advantage of kind of rebranding, if you will, of saying like, let's take these projects that maybe we've neglected, and that we haven't done well enough, and promote them and highlight them, and if we say transhumanism, then everyone's suddenly interesting, mm. or do you think that there's, there's another additional element um, to this that, that really distinguishes more transhumanism from some of these common projects of most societies in the world. It, it's not just medicine. It's okay. clearly because medicine is about curing. And mm. if, we, we, if we make the claim so that we move beyond the current personal boundaries, yeah. then this is clearly not curing, that's enhancing. Right. That's altering. 
That's right. using the talents for developing something new. Uh -huh. And so we clearly move beyond just the cure, just the medical purpose. Yeah. And um, can I rephrase? Yeah. Because it seems to me what I'm hearing is um, human enhancement, even in your own description of what you were calling transhumanism. But when I hear transhuman, I, I hear leaving behind or going beyond. So I had a something which was called human, and now I have a superhuman or a beyond a human. Now, it, it sounds like when you, when you unpack it, there's no necessity about that leaving behind the human or going off to this other non-human thing. Because you just described enhancement. But a, a human um, that's more robust or stronger or smarter or faster could still be human. So what's the necessity about the label yeah. transhuman? The label actually comes from the Catholic background. Ah, because it was Dante, originally, you know, Dante, <laughs> no, Dante, in Dante he coined the term transhumanare. Yeah, I believe the first canto of uh, Paradiso. He's going through and he meets the souls and he's so <laughs> impressed by these saints, by these amazing individuals, heroes of the faith for us, that he speaks of this transhumanar, this they, they've gone they've gone beyond uh, natural capacities, and and I think that that is still a very healthy, helpful framework for Catholics today, right? When when we speak of the life of grace, when we speak of what the transformation, interior transformation that happens in just a simple baptism of a little baby, right? This idea that they share in divine life and that they're going to be able to exercise these acts of faith, hope, and charity, and eventually heroic virtue that they wouldn't be able to do through their own human natural capacities. You know, it's interesting that when the church goes to recognize a saint, the whole formal canonization process, a lot of people fixate on the end part where the church has to see, okay, did this person perform some sort of miracle from heaven? And that's fascinating and, and, and valuable. But to even get there, you have to demonstrate that you've lived consistently a life of heroic virtue. And so from a Catholic perspective, as you're pointing out, there's that sense of God, through grace, allows us to go beyond the human, to do something that our own human capacities would not be able to achieve. But, of course, from the Catholic perspective, it's very much a surpassing that fulfills right it's it's a, a transhumanism that never ceases to be a humanism it's sort of the fullest flourishing of the person in accord with an essential nature right a metaphysical kind a way of being and that way of being is is fulfilled paradoxically by being uh, by its capacities being surpassed through a gift, right? So there's also very much that dimension of, of a transcendent gift and then a very real human collaboration that's played out on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I see a lot of fascinating uh, uh, parallels, but of course, as I'm sure you're going to explain, right? Not everyone who talks about transhumanism today is thinking exclusively in terms of Dante. They might be thinking of Julian Huxley or other more recent thinkers. Exactly, sort of in, in Dante, it was also something which happened after that. So it's, sort of, so it's not something which happened primarily during one's life, though that's a clear difference between sort of the Dante's, the context in which Dante talks about it, maybe not necessarily, but primarily. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a good point. Uh, I, would, I would agree that, that Dante is highlighting it very much on his vision of the afterlife, of the end goal. Um, and so it's most evident and apparent and, and shocking to him in that state. But I, I would say what he wants to communicate in line with the whole Catholic tradition is that though we don't experience fully all of the glory and splendor of Christian transhumanism, of divinization, it already begins. A lot of spiritual authors speak of how grace, the, the, the divine life given at baptism, is the seed of eternal glory, mm -hmm. right? So the seed is not nearly as impressive as the mighty tree, but there's a continuity. So it, it's not as evident, it's not as clear, but it's begun here. And, and to kind of come back to the point, I think it's helpful for us to remember that 
The church looks for heroic virtue. So it's, it's fruits, it, there are manifestations in your daily life that, that show to others in a mysterious way that something beyond the merely human is occurring here. So I would fully agree that the full flourishing and, and the exper full experience of that is what we'd say an eschatological reality, right? Something after this life. But I, I think it's unfortunate that Catholics... <laughs> I'll let you go, I'll let you go. I'll let the Catholics speak. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's unfortunate that Catholics have forgotten that that type of transfigured, transhumanized life is meant to begin here. And I think it's precisely because we've forgotten our own patrimony, we've forgotten our own transhumanist roots, that we get all sorts of problems like uh, legalistic morality. The faith life becomes very burdensome because it seems like we're just following a set of arbitrary norms. We have to go to this place. We have to sing some silly songs together. We have to put up with these rules and regulations. And then maybe if we're good boys and girls, we won't burn forever in, in eternal flames, right? That's such a, a dour and, and sad view of the Christian faith, but unfortunately, to some degree, that's how many live it. Whereas if we go back to this patrimony of, of transhumanist thinking and life, and we see it as something lived here already, then suddenly our, our, our experience and our journey is so much more positive. And it's not just about avoiding uh, the naughty things or the sins, it's, it's about cultivating our talents, like you talked about. Like, we should cultivate our talents at a natural and supernatural level. We should be wildly creative and, and productive. And you look at the saints, and they're praying humbly in their room, and then the next moment they're building hospitals and schools and orphanages, and they're, they're living that, that love that you highlighted earlier. But I, I want to give the Catholic a chance to speak. <laughs> well, very nice because I want to get your take on what your version of transhumanism vis-a-vis uh, -vis Father Michael's explanation, because I would sum it up like this, that um, grace perfects nature, um, but it doesn't destroy nature. And so the eschaton, the, the end times, is something that Jesus ushered in. It's such that we now live in the eschaton. Um, that is something that is inaugurated, even if not consummated. So it begins with faith and baptism, um, but that is, um, meets its maximal point in heaven, when we see God face to face without the mediation of creatures, that is post-mortem experience. But even now, as it says again and again in the scriptures, John 5, 24 is one example that he who believes has eternal life in, in the present. The, the participation in divine life is begun here in this inaugurated eschaton, and it is uh, reaches its maximal point in the consummated eschaton. I think that's the, the Catholic tradition here. But... Um, I'm probably quite, not what yeah, you're usually so talking about with your humanity. Human or, or <laughs> Let us know. Exactly. So what then, it, it sounded like when you were describing what I would have called human enhancement, you were actually thinking in, in terms of this world. In other words, God didn't need to intervene to gives us, uh, make us stronger, faster, or more healthy. Is that is that fair to say? How would you describe it? No, I, I think that's a fair description. So, there's a possibility to, to interpreting the way you just presented it. And I don't think there's a necessary conflict with sort of what is widely shared, what is sort of the core of transhumanism. Um, however, the central elements is it's about, um, well, moving on beyond the boundaries and thereby there's a wide range of different goals which are being aimed for by transhumanists. And there is the most radical one is obviously the one sort of Elon Musk presents, you know, maybe in you know 20 years time we'll be uploaded personalities. We can put our our brain, our personality onto a hard drive, and that would be that would go along with us turning into post-humans. So the most radical way of of transhumanism, sort of that silicon-based transhumanism where our further development, our turning into post-human takes place by means of our personality getting digitized. I'm very critical. I'm not excluding the possibility, I don't, I, but I, I don't find it very interesting either because I don't, don't think sort of in the, in the forthcoming decade that's not something which can be realized. I think it has no practical relevance for us whatsoever 
for sort of the near future. That's why I think so the people who mentioned that, Elon Musk and his friends, they're the ones who tell that story because it sort of resonates with a lot of people. You see it in, you know, in Black Mirror, you see it in, in various Netflix series. series and so on. <laughs> And, 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 you know, students love talking about that, and it's fascinating what it's like to be right. on a hard drive. But from a practical purpose, it has, I don't think it has any relevance whatsoever in the near future. There are other stuff which are really, uh, you know, when it comes to digitalization, which are strongly relevant, but this is not one of them. It's just a way to get into the media, because people love talking about that. That's the most radical form of transhumanism. The other option, which in many cases, as you already mentioned, is is often sort of distinguished as being already post-humanism, right? At least for some, well, or, well, I'll, I'll let you unpack your yeah. version, but at least for some thinkers, they, it seems that they want to make this distinction as transhumanism being yeah. this period of very radical enhancement to the point where we get to this post-human sort of superior species state that is disembodied. But it sounds like you have a different understanding of, of post-humanism. Yeah, post-humanism is it's, it's a very different notion. We need five further episodes to <laughs> unpack sort of the notion of post-humanism because there is a clear difference between transhumanism and critical post-humanism. And basically, it was part of my academic endeavor sort of to get these two movements in contact, to get them talking to each other. Critical post-humanism has to do with something that's an outgrowth of, of Foucault, of Deleuze, sort of French philosophy, and, and transhumanism is embedded in the Anglo-American world, which has to do with, you know, enhancement. And so when we talk about, there are hardly any leading transhumanists who actually use the word post-humanism when they want to refer to transhumanism. So I would, I would keep these two movements really separate, what we talk about is, is transhumanism and the ones who have the uploaded mind as, as the post-human in, in mind as a goal. That's simply, that's one of the, one of the notions of the post-human within transhumanism. So right. one of the notions is, so the uploaded mind, a further possibility of the post-human is, 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 well, the coming about of another species, so an evolutionary development. And the third notion of the post-human is, you know, someone still belonging to, to the human species, but having at least one capacity which significantly goes beyond the capacities current persons possess. And it's sort of, it is in the interest of transhumanists to, to realize that, to realize in a, a post-human in one of these, in one of these senses. But it could mean one still remains a human, but has significantly further developed more complex capacities. And why should we want to have them? Well, because it helps us. Look, if we have better um, developed capacities concerning intelligence, for example, it just helps us to making better decisions. We can make better plans concerning future right. actions, and then we know if we're more careful, you know, we, 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 we stay healthier, we, have a, we, we live longer, because that's often connected to um, making predictions, knowing what will happen, what will happen next. So, um, yeah, that's why, yeah, let's no, keep I, I, post humanism and transhumanism as a movement separate, well, but so yeah, they're different notions of the post-human yes. within transhumanism. Exactly, I think that's important because, you know, those of our readers or our followers who will eventually read some of this literature yeah. are going to encounter the term post-human in a transhumanist context exactly. in which transhumanist thinkers use post-human to say, well, we're going to get to this non-human, presumably superior species, and normally a disembodied species, which I think is where a lot of the, the critique and, and fear or anxiety from Catholic or other thinkers comes, because it seems to be a kind of humanism that morphs into an anti-humanism, or humanism that says, well, eventually humans are going to become obsolete, and eventually we need to get rid of something fundamental to our humanity, namely our embodiment. Whereas you're very helpful because you're saying, well, there's a whole set of other serious thinkers who use primarily the term post-human in a very different sense, which is one that affirms humanity, improves humanity without dispensing with an essential aspect of humanity. So I think that, that distinction is very helpful. 
And actually, uh, at the origins of when the term transhumanism was first coined by Julian Huxley in 1951, very often the wrong date is also cited in his, his many use the new, uh, the wine new bottles, yeah. yeah, the new bottle for new wine um, um, from 1957, which is which is the wrong date. 1951 actually published an article where he coined the term transhumanism, and at that time he was also friends with Thierry de Chardin. Yes, and, 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 and like Jesuit priest, yeah. Uh, exactly, and in, in his unpublished writings, sort of, you will actually find the term transhumanizing as well. Okay. So there's a close connection, and there's some. I, I, sorry to cut yeah. you off, <laughs> but I was so excited because recently uh, someone call, called to my attention that back in 1984, Pope John Paul II gathered with artists in the beautiful basilica. Uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, close to the Pantheon, and he was celebrating the great artist Fra Angelico, and he was holding up Fra Angelico as a model for artists, right? And at one point in the, the homily, the Pope spoke of the transhumanizing <laughs> value of sacred art. So definitely part of our patrimony, which unfortunately we've, we've forgotten. And so, I mean, it sounds like what your your approach is doing is is highlighting improvement in life, highlighting these different capacities, these different talents that we have as human beings, and trying to maximizing maximize them without being afraid or putting kind of status quo limits on us of saying, well, we've only ever been this intelligent, or we've only ever been this fast, or we've only ever been this strong, or our memory has only ever been able to contain so much. So let's not let the status quo or the past determine the future. Let's let's maximize and go beyond that. I mean, if it, it, if that's what you're presenting, or as far as you're presenting that, it I certainly don't have any problem with that. Actually, I think it would be irresponsible for us not to use technology, not to use education, not to use other means to harness all of these talents. And we were chatting with uh, uh, a thinker we both admire. Um, uh, we were chatting about. Uh, Nicanor uh, Austriaco, a, a great um, American bioethicist, did his work at MIT in biology, became a, a Catholic Dominican priest, but continues to work in his lab with his students. Um, and he's done a lot of work recently in trying to get us beyond the enhancement therapy dichotomy, right? Like, okay, uh, the it, therapy is okay as long as you're just fixing a problem, you're making us healthy again, but let's not become healthier than healthy. And he says, well, no, we can become healthier than healthy so long as they're therapeutic enhancements, right? So long as that enhancement, that improvement is not undermining some other therapeutic good. And I would add, and I've, I've written about this, so long as it's not undermining our, our potential to grow in non-physical ways to pursue other non-physical goods, whether that's friendship, whether that's charity or service or compassion, right? As long as that's in place. Can you give an example? Are you thinking of terms of like lifespan, for example? Is that, would that fit in that category? Uh, well, yeah. So healthier I, than healthy means. So he, he uses the example of, say, statins to treat um, uh, LDL kind of bad cholesterol levels. And he says that there's a certain range for a healthy uh, male in the United States, mm -hmm. but if you use these statins and you, you lower the uh, low-density lipoprotein uh, levels below that healthy range, there are no clear negative impacts. Okay. There's no problem in your health. You certainly don't you know, lose your capacity to pursue virtue. You don't become... Uh, infuriated with people, you don't lose control of your temper, right? It's not affecting your pursuit of, of non-physical goods. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually just giving you a better cardiovascular function and a lower potential of running into problems later. So it's an enhancement in the sense that you're going beyond the statistical norm of health. You are healthier than healthy at that point, but it's a therapeutic enhancement. And so something like that, say, Wonderful, bring it on. And like for lifespan, for instance, I would say if you can live for more years in a, in a healthy state, 
as we already mentioned, great, I can teach more students, I can celebrate more masses, I can hear more confessions, I can write more books, I can do more YouTube episodes, uh, I can spend quality time with family and friends, I can console the suffering, I can feed the poor. Wonderful, that's great. Now, of course, I think we both recognize that I could just as well use that extra decade or two to swindle people, to deceive them, to destroy property, to rob. So I, I think that these are potential good things, but that they, they have to be guided, right? They have to be directed. <laughs> That's where I just come back to the old school ideas of human nature, virtue, prudence, right? I think that they're, they have a perennial relevance. And I, I, what, what's fascinated me about transhumanism, posthumanism, is the way that serious reflection on emerging technologies has brought us back to the most perennial, profound philosophical questions. And I love that. I love that we're talking seriously about human nature, human happiness, flourishing, improving society. That's great. And I want to keep that conversation going. I agree. That's, that's also sort of what fascinated me um, with transhumanism. I, I got it interested in it, sort of on the one I had a strong natural science grounding, on the other hand, um, well, with a Catholic upbringing, and so the tension, and then I, then I dealt with a lot of Nietzsche and Spinoza, yeah. Plato, and trying to bring all these ver various facets together, getting engaged in bioethical debates, ethics of AI, and, and, and then what happened actually 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, and in, in Germany there was sort of Peter Sloterdijk who mm. gave a presentation on rules for the human zoo, and that brought about a massive debate. This is when I first became acquainted with Franz Jürgen, so it was more than 20 years ago already. And, and he basically, he was seen as a transhuman and every, everyone was going against him because, well, he was, he was regarded as someone or the others perceived him as being in favor of genetic modification technologies, which he actually is not. He's actually very critical of that, so he's extremely bioconservative. Right. Um, however, he was using also transhumanism, the notion of the posthuman. He was talking about the issues, probably just to provoke, because he was referring to Heidegger, Nietzsche and Plato, and all of them are not necessar necessarily seen as the most liberal democratic thinkers. Right. Um, and, and, and so, and, and, and that inspired me or triggered me and made me aware of the challenges which go along, really fundamental philosophical challenges which go along with the latest technologies, with gene technologies, brain-computer interface, digital technologies, because they force you to reflect upon the most fundamental exactly. aspects of our existence, of who we are, how we re relate to, to God, to the world, to the environment, you know, how right. can we make sense of that? Um, what is the foundation of morality? Um, right. yeah. How can that be justified? So, and, and yeah, it, in particular, and, and this is something sort of at the beginning of life issues, this is sort of where the things get a bit, you know, challenging sure. in particular. Um, and, and, and sort of the debate, so what happens so in, in a regular, uh, uh, regular natural fertilization? Uh -huh. So once we realize, for example, that was a debate I've had with um, um, the scholar you just mentioned, um, Austriaco. Austriaco. And, 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 and so what happens there in a regular fertilization, mm -hmm. um, so you only bring the third, only every third fertilized embryo gets attached to the womb. Yes. And the, there, in two cases, in two out of three cases, fertilization occurs, and sort of, um, and they simply they flow out. Spontaneous abortion. Well, it's, it's they they flow out. One doesn't even realize the okay. they don't yeah. even realize that sort of a fertilization had taken place before. Right. And if one if one assumes if one um, um, takes it for granted that at that time fertilization animation, the connection with the rational soul actually takes place, mm -hmm. wouldn't that mean that in a regular circumstance, so someone has one child, 
and two other children who were born dead. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as problematic for some reason? That this I see as problematic for for this understanding um, what, that animation actually has taken place with fertilization. I'm sort of that's why I also mention sort of Thomistic mm -hmm. understand. There is no need for having. There is no, not even rational a need for having it start so early. Um, well, I think you're, you're bringing up so tremendous <laughs> issues. Okay? You're bringing up tremendous issues. I, I just want to frame it a little bit because I know we yes. were talking about yeah. uh, these these topics before <laughs> the the filming, and so maybe yeah. our viewers don't quite know why we're going uh, to this topic. Yeah. I mean, just to make everyone aware, uh, you you've mentioned that there are these kind of silicon based transhumanist proposals, which in the second chapter of your book you lay out, and then very helpfully you move to you know, the more carbon-based, the, the, in a sense the more realistic, the more present, uh, current uses of technology that are actually being implemented, right? We're not talking about Ray Kurzweil's 2045 or whenever it's been rescheduled. We're not talking about a future state. Yeah, we can upload our right, yeah, right. The internet. We're talking about basically here and now we're already using certain forms of technology and there are proposals. Um, you know, we mentioned um, in our conversation Julian Savalescu at Oxford who has this principle of procreative beneficence, this idea that not only can, but we really should use technology like in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to actively select those embryos that will most likely produce the children with the best chance of the best life, which introduces a whole host of questions about what is the best life, who decides, etc. We'll do another episode on that. But just to kind of frame the question, okay, why are we talking about embryos, right? Because here and now, we're not talking about the future. Here and now, there are proposals for radical enhancement or types of enhancements that are intimately connected with the technology we already have. And so it makes a big difference, right, whether you say, okay, well, we've got this kind of genetic material, we've got these different cells, which we'll manipulate and we'll set up some conditions so eventually better people will arrive versus a perspective that says, wait, wait, these are already human persons that are being radically altered and many of whom are actually being destroyed in order to advance a select few. So you're absolutely right that these metaphysical <laughs> questions about identity of the embryo are inescapable if we're going to face seriously these enhancement issues. Um, you raise a lot of fascinating points and I think that it certainly it is initially disturbing to think of maybe the number of embryos who are not able to implant and do not continue. Um, so I don't want to take anything away from the perplexity of that, and I don't have a kind of answer. I'm not going to play the theodicy game of saying this is why God allows this. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I guess I would say with a lot of other thinkers that it's somewhat comparable to the harsh reality of, say, infant mortality, right? Thankfully, in many of our countries, that's been reduced, not eliminated. But the fact that even to this day, many children are not able to survive their first months or even many years on this earth, it, it, that, I'm, I'm not happy about that, I'm not excited about that, I don't understand why that's the case, but it doesn't cause in me any doubt about the moral worth or value or ontological identity of an infant or of a child or a newly born. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a right emotional response and it's a right correct perplexity, but I don't, I don't see that as kind of undermining the fundamental continuity between you and I and our embryonic state. But the question is now when when does sort of that identity begin? Mm -hmm. Now we so in the initial two weeks you still have the possibility of twins. identical twins coming right. about. Right. After two weeks there is there's still the possibility of Siamese twins to come mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So the question of identity is is, is a central one, no? And yeah. so that's I just wanna say and without trying to give any any answer, right. answer no, right. Right. just there there's not even a clear theological reason, which I'm aware of, 
Okay. Which has it start right at the fertilization. Okay, yeah, we talked about this so a little bit before, so let's unpack it. No? Um, so first off, you, you <laughs> raised a great, great issue of twinning, which, I mean, was a huge deal in the UK with the Warnock report and, and the decision that influenced many other countries to say, well, if in these four, two weeks, 14 days or so, there's the possibility of division, then there's not an indiviz individual, therefore we can use and engage in research, even destructive research, with this material. So this is, a, this is not just an abstract ivory tower philosophical question, this has shaped public policy in many nations. And again, like most things we've been talking about, it's worth the whole episode, but my sort of original, my initial response to that would be the desire to distinguish between um, indivisible and undivided. So I'm willing to acknowledge that in these first two weeks, there's a possibility of division, and we know that there, there's twinning. And so we might not have an indivisible entity, but I think we have an undivided entity, and I'm comfortable with the notion of asexual reproduction, a kind of budding. I mean, cut up, you know, when you're a kid, you cut up your worms and you make new worms, right? So I'm willing to acknowledge that there could be these somewhat odd, unusual cases of, of budding. I'm not saying the twins are odd or unusual, right? But it's, it's the less common way of reproduction. But I, I don't have a problem acknowledging there are these cases of asexual reproduction. And one, there was one individual, and now a new individual has come from another individual. And you don't have to get into sibling rivalry about who was first, who produced whom, right? So I'm comfortable with that, of acknowledging the, that there may not be indivisibility, but there's still an undivided entity, and then later at some stage there's a second entity. So I think that would be, for me, very important. And then you brought up a fascinating uh, theological issue that we were chatting about, because most Catholics think that it's a dogma to say that at the moment of fertilization, there is definitely 100% without doubt uh, a human person, and that philosophical teaching has been dogmatically defined. So I get why people think that. Um, but just to add a little nuance, and I don't want to confuse people, and I don't want to say that the church like has serious doubts about the personal dignity of the embryo, because she doesn't, and she's never taught or promoted those doubts. But uh, I talked to you about how years ago there was a document in 1987, Donum Vitae, from the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, and it was addressing these new developments in assisted reproductive technology. And so it came to questions of the, the human embryo. And it, it advocated a, a very respectful treatment of that embryo, a treatment of the embryo as a person, without coming down clearly with a dogmatic decision of this philosophical truth. Now, a kind of sequel document to this one came out in 2007, Dignitas Personae. It's the most recent systematic bioethics document from the magisterium, from the teaching authority of the church. And it came to this issue, and it, it wanted to maintain this delicate distinction. Um, so I, I've got the, the, the text here, right? Because I, I, I knew we were talking about because it it's such an important issue. And, and it, so the, the document says, the body of a human being from the very first stages of his existence can never be reduced merely to a group of cells. The embryonic human body develops progressively according to a well-defined program with its proper finality, as is apparent from the birth of every baby. Okay, so just especially for the Catholic viewers who might think I'm a complete heretic and are filling the comments <laughs> with hateful comments, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that the church doesn't treat the embryo as a person or has serious doubts about this or this is some, you know, just question that people are constantly debating. So I think it's pretty clear from the document that there's that acknowledgement. We have a genetically distinct individual human being that has its own trajectory of development, and that can be disturbed in different ways, but given that development will continue to form and, and become like us, right? But then the document goes on um, to say that the the ethical principle, so talking about this respect of the person, is capable of rec it, which reason is capable of recognizing as true and in conformity with the natural moral law, should be the basis for all legislation in this area. So 
if we really think that this embryo should be treated as a person, it makes sense that laws and regulations reflect that, right? It presupposes a truth of an ontological character, as Don Vite demonstrated from solid, solid scientific evidence regarding the continuity and development of a human being. But then it goes on, this dignitas personae, to say, if Don Vite, in order to avoid a statement of an explicitly philosophical nature, did not, note, did not define the embryo as a person, it nonetheless did indicate that there is an intrinsic connection between the ontological dimension and the specific value of every human life. Although the presence of the spiritual soul cannot be observed experimentally, the conclusions of science regarding the human embryo give a valuable indication for discerning, by the use of reason, a personal presence at the moment of the first appearance of a human life. How could a human individual not be a human person? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there, but just to kind of clarify that, that nuance, basically the church says we, as a church, are not going to come down hard and fast with a philosophical, on a philosophical issue. But it seems that the best science available to us indicates, again, a genetically distinct human individual with a biological continuity and, and a trajectory of development that unites the adult back to the embryo. So it would seem to be arbitrary to treat that embryo, in other words, that human being at an earlier stage, in a radically different way. And so it would seem to be irresponsible and ethically irresponsible mm -hmm. for us to, in a sense, discriminate against that embryonic life simply because it's of a smaller size, it doesn't look the same way, that we adults look, right, what's the ground so often for horrible expressions of discrimination to this day? You look different than I do. You have different characteristics than I do. You have different, you exercise different abilities than I do. So, so the church's perspective is, let's not fall into that unjust discrimination because of these external differences. If there's a fundamental unity uh, and and dignity and identity that, that unites us all, even if this embryonic life is extremely vulnerable and, and may not continue and, and might uh, perish for various reasons, right? It's extremely vulnerable life. But as Alistair McIntyre, the, the philosopher, once said, we all live on varying degrees of disability, right? Like the fully, completely autonomous person is kind of an illusion, right? All of us live in this network of vulnerability and uh, sort of uncalculated giving, giving and gracious receiving. So that vulnerability is extremely evident in the embryonic life, but it can become very evident in our later stages of our life or after injury or moments of sickness, etc. Anyway, that, that, just to add the, the nuance to that question, you're right that there's not that strict, hard and fast theological dogma on the moment of ensoulment, but a long-standing reflection that has advanced since the time of Thomas Aquinas, and I'm, I'm a huge Thomas Aquinas fan, but a reflection that's significantly advanced thanks, thanks to the developments of science, says basically the best science and best philosophy that we have would suggest that we should treat this embryo as a person, and it would seem to be unjust discrimination to do otherwise. Yeah, but the best science doesn't necessarily lead to the best metaphysics. <laughs> so, but by means of empirical research, you don't necessarily get the insight that how should you know that sort of an immaterial soul was connected on the basis of scientific research. You might get some specific reasons why you want to uphold something, but that obviously doesn't is not a necessity. It's not a metaphysical necessity then. Mm -hmm animation already has taken place at such an early stage. And, and most, you know, also in the Catholic tradition, most have taken sort of that gradual animation for granted for many centuries. So I'm just trying to stress, and you know, it's, there's, coming from such an understanding, saying with the gradual animation, which 
which which assumes which which argues for that you know the animation the connection with the rational soul gets connected with the body could come at the later stage I don't think there is necessary this even though now for 150 for 150 years this has such a such a strong tradition in the Catholic Church I just want to open the possibility the thought is that really necessarily the case? Mm -hmm. Do we, you know, do each one of us, do we all have two siblings which died because the attachment to the womb? I don't understand the strength of this argument, yeah. so help me with this. Is it just that, it's, is it because it's, it's sad, it's not true? Uh, what's, the, what's the logic behind this? Do we mourn? We don't even realize that this has happened. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's not a necessary argument. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's just sort of, sort of the images which get con connected, the thoughts yeah. which you have. Is would you? Is there a sadness that because you know that this has happened and attachment didn't take place, that's the reason for for you to mourn about something? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not saying that's that. As I said, it's not a necessary argument which says. Uh, which which is in favor of animation then taking place or not, but just as an additional. What would you be for? Is the um, is the point of this um, line of argument in order to allow for experimentation in the early exactly. stages? Is that where we're going with this? Or? And I think that's sort of one one shouldn't underestimate sort of embryonic stem cell research okay. can actually bring about a lot of benefits, okay. so sort of improving the quality of human lives curing diseases, increasing the health span, and, and, and sort of by allowing that, by having identity, taking the stance that sort of, you know, animation takes place later, that opens up so many possibilities for improving personal lives much further. That's why I think it's 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 worth considering or reflecting. So on let's say let's say in the best of scenarios we could allow for the question, like you said, you're not trying to make sure and fast arguments that no. this is not the case, but if we just ask the question, well, what if it's not ensouled, that embryo? Um, even if in that sense of, in that space of doubt, would one be justified to destroy potential human beings? Like, if we don't know, is that enough? Would, that, would you feel uh, safe and secure enough in destroying that um, potential human being Oh no, where it's kind of, it reminds me of that scenario of like, you see something stir in the woods, well do you shoot? It, it might be a deer, it might be a human being. Um, it sounds to me dangerous, uh, a kind of prudential judgment to be able, like, just because I have doubt that I would be willing to, I, I think if I'm, you help me here, because are the, are the technologies, are they not destructive of those um, zygotes, of those um, fertilized eggs? No, of course, as a, as a consequence, once you sort of just analyze the totipotent cells, analyzing means destruction. Okay. And that's, that's, that's a clear case, sort of, in the case, very specific example, pre-implantation genetic diagnose, um, right. and in some cases... Which, as we said, is very much tied to these pro proposals of uh, appropriate beneficence. Um, so you want to analyze what you've confronted with here. In some of these procedures, um, and not all of them, you remove one or two cells in the initial phases where you only have eight or ten cells. And here all ten cells are totipotent, which means a fully grown adult could, could develop out of them. And by doing this diagnosis, it means you remove one or two cells, totipotent cells, and, and you destroy them. And that would mean you kill one or two um, persons. As a consequence, and that is, that's a strong statement, no? Yes. Right. But, but I, do you see what I'm saying about the question of doubt? Like, no. I, if if we have, if all we have is doubt, not certainty, yay or nay, is that justification to destroy? No. If, if the thing is, so you, you asked the question with potentiality before. Yeah. Well, but I, I don't think potentiality is is in, in any way relevant. If, if potentiality was relevant. Then you know, um, a single egg cell, a single a sperm cell alone would be sufficient for attributing dignity to these specific entities because they're potentially, um, given the right circumstances, they are potentially persons. The same applies to 
uh, the same applies. Uh, you know, what I meant by that expression, by the way, is that they're either persons or they're not. But I am is subjectively in a state of uncertainty about whether they are or whether they aren't. I'm not saying that they um, will become. I mean, it, in my gut reaction would be they probably are persons because I like that rhetorical question. How did it go? If they are human individuals, yeah, how do they human not, individual be not be a, a human, human person? Human person. Right. Like, what are the criteria that mm -hmm. distinguish That's a good this question. category? That's of a very good question. Human persons from non-persons. But but I still I, so that's what I meant. But when I was saying are potential persons, that I'm saying they they may or they may not. But just like that thing moving in the woods may or may not be a person, that doesn't give me justification to shoot at what's there. What would you say about the possibility of making research on a fertilized egg which doesn't get attached? If we Same. were able to to do research on that, if the alternative is simply to it's oh, it's because, because because it's destined to die. Well, I'm destined to die. I'm yeah. destined to die, but that's not a justification to kill me. So I don't it, think it matters. There is yeah. there is still the possibility of doubt, sort of, mm -hmm. and and the doubt is stronger, <laughs> sort of, when it comes to fertilized egg than when it comes to you and me. No, and when it comes right. to you and me, so we've nervous systems. Sure. We we've got a fully developed brain. And one could raise similar issues actually at the end of life. So if it was only like about 50 years ago when a new definition um, of death has been implemented. Yeah, the, the, the whole yeah. whole brain dead. No, and so right. you could still be connected to to a ventilator, breathe, um, and and you would be legally dead. This is what is sort of wide shared in all different parts of the world. But there is so many. Uh, aspects why one could argue at the same time well what we're confronted with is still a person no? right so it seems to me we're talking about a, a subjective question and an objective question objective is that which is right and so a person is either or is not <laughs> right those are that's a, that's on the level of um, ontological uh, the order whereas then the other is my lo the logical order of that which I know to be right so um, when the person is just coming into being, I might have um, a doubt or an uncertainty. That's at the subjective level. Even at the objective level, it's in either, it's, it's there or it's not there. And it seems to me at the same at the end of life. And so I might have, this is, what's the fallacy of the beard? I like that. It's like, um, like I, I don't know exactly what, I, I shaved this morning, I, I've got nothing here. You know, but uh, you know, well, I may have doubt about when it becomes worthy of the name beard. Right. Um, but there's no doubt that there is such a thing <laughs> as a beard. Right. Right. And so I think what we're talking here is, what we're dabbling into is, when we're in that uncomfortable space, when we don't have metaphysical certainty about that which is, is that justification enough to be the cause of death, if in fact there was a human person there? Right, just, just kind of build on that point, because there's also one of my concerns, is that it, it seems as though in this particular case, the, the church is exercising a certain degree of, of humility of saying, well, we have all of these reasons to think this is a human person, but we're not going to put all of our authority behind it and declare it dogmatically. But it would be irresponsible for us to risk the destruction of life by not acting in accord with our best information. I think, thankfully, in this particular area, um, with the developments of induced pluripotent uh, stem cells and, and breakthroughs that have been made there. I, I, I think, thankfully, there are so many promising areas of research that kind of bring us beyond the necessity of turning uh, so exclusively uh, to embryos for to help people who are clearly suffering and need our assistance and aid, and who I hope receive assistance mm -hmm. and aid. But do, do you see kind of how, I, maybe ironically, the, this sort of research requires a kind of dogmatism or a kind of Certainty? Uh, no, I, I don't, because we live in so many contingencies and so many mm -hmm. uncertainties. The, the, all our confrontations, there's always the, we just they're just gray areas. Mm -hmm. I'm never certain sort of how what's the uh, what's the appropriate thing to do in specific circumstances. Right, right. If, I mean, it's just if we, you know if one thinks about if one thinks about the the, the, the poor um, and and sort of. Uh, I, I, I see us living in, in, you know, in, in Rome, in, 
This is luxurious circumstances. Right. You know, the space we have. And, it's, and, all you know, it's, effects, <laughs> it's all studio effects. All studio effects. We're on the streets of Rome, freezing yeah. right now. <laughs> but. So, um, you know, in, in a way, you know, if one really took this seriously, wouldn't that be the need of the government taking human rights seriously just the yeah. right to life? Wouldn't yes. there have to be the need to implement taxes on any kinds of luxury goods as long as people die of hunger? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an absolute, you know, the minimum requirement of a human, right. you know, of the right. demands of human rights? And so, yeah. but we well, compromise. It, 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 you know, this is what. Yeah, it's it's fascinating you mention that because I remember church fathers, um, maybe Saint John Chrysostom yeah. and others, you know, early Christian thinkers who would have these striking kind of social justice fr f phrases where they say things like, you "Don't pat yourself on the back because you give from your excess to the poor. Mm -hmm. If you didn't give them, you'd be stealing from them. They they have more of a right <laughs> to your items." then you have a right to celebrate your generosity. So I think that you're, you're highlighting such an important call to each and every one of us to examine more seriously our, our ethical behavior, right? And our, our negligence in so many areas of human rights and, and human dignity. I, I agree, unfortunately. And, and, and sort of this is just a way sort of we make a lot of pragmatic adaptations. Uh -huh. We live with many uncertainties permanently. We don't know what the appropriate approach is. And we know pragmatically, well, if any political leader implemented such laws on taxing luxurious good, they wouldn't get re-elected anymore. So right. it is these sort of these pragmatic elements which I try to focus on. And the same applies to, and the same applies in, in, in these beginning of life or end of life circumstances. And you also see, well, you know, there's so many just not getting attached it's, we have, we're really, there, there have been many, many intellect, philosopher theologians in the history who, there are good reasons for uh, gradual animation, it might well be the case, and, and now we see the advantages which go along with embryonic stem cell research and the potential for increasing the human flourishing and promoting the health span further. So that's why I have a tendency sort of to see sort of way, you know, it's, it's, we weigh the various advantages, disadvantages, without being a utilitarian. No, um, mm. it's it's not a utilitarian approach, but it, it's a very pragmatic, as good as it gets approach. We are all, you know, we we none of us has ultimately any kind of certainty. There's always sort of the underlying doubt, even in particular when it comes to the most fundamental questions. That's why I think... So, so you devote a whole chapter in this book to fictive ethics. Could you just briefly unpack I've been that? waiting for this. I don't know what fictive ethics is, and I've been dying for an hour to find out. Find we'll put a hashtag on Fictive that. ethics, please. Enlighten me. <laughs> so to, just to summarize, uh, maybe just to come briefly come back to the final... So, so I, I don't think when, when it comes to these scientific reflections on what we should do in order uh, which t enhancement technologies are, um, should we use and which we, we shouldn't. Um, in the end, sort of, what transhumanism does not provide an answer to the ultimate questions, to ask the logical issues. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is, there is not, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, they don't have any, any answers to these questions. You know, what will come after? Will there be something? Will there not be something? It is merely about it is merely about what we can do in order to improve the quality of life here uh, and now. Here and now, okay. exactly, and that's why sort of. And I'm trying to show sort of how can we find pragmatically the best way possible, also to accommodate. And, and when it comes to ethics, I think it's important to to accommodate the various the great variety of perspectives. So when it comes to political decision makings. Um, even if one has a clear understanding of what is the moral thing to do, um, it's it's not a pragmatic option to implement that politically. Because on a political on a political scale, uh, one needs to one needs to take care of the great variety of 
of values, of norms which are being shared within the society. Otherwise, it becomes too much of a paternalistic approach. Mm -hmm. So one, one. Um, but that's legalism. That's downstream of one's philosophical, ethical approach. But when you speak of fictive, you're speaking, I think, more philosophically, are you not? Do, yes, yeah. Do. Explain that. Okay. that one. <laughs> so he's been up all night <laughs> thinking about <laughs> this. <laughs> he's been <laughs> pestering me, telling me I need to hear about this. I'm only going to come to the interview if he talks it's about it. About this. <laughs> so first, so the S, so the logical issues. That's not. There's not a problem. Not a conflict with okay. transhumanism. Um, what I'm presenting, and this is what I'm doing um, when it comes to the values, yes. Um, in the end, the values, based on a hermeneutic approach in the end, hermeneutic in the sense of we are always permanently caught in that circle of, on the one hand, we're being brought up with some theoretical reflections, then we have experience in the world which make us alter the values and norms which we were brought up in, so, how, how should we enter the circle in the best manner? There is, no, there is no right answer. We always have criteria on the basis, on the basis of which we just judge whatever we experience. So, and that raises doubts concerning, um, concerning an essentialist criterion, concerning one foundation which, which provides us with, with a certain answer concerning questions of morality. So fictive ethic means? And the fictive ethic means that in the end, well, this is now a slight shift from what I just said, but um, the, because of a couple of further steps I would have had to make in between, but fictive ethic in the end means, yes, no, the norms and values which each one of us has, actually they go down their human fictions. They are made up by us. And there is no ultimate criterion which makes us go beyond, which makes us state why some norms and norms and values mm. would be better than others. I think we're getting to your Nietzschean background here now. That is that is Nietzschean background, but we also what we said before, there's sort of that that realm of doubt, which is also in in the in, in, in the in the Christian tradition, sort of um, we, we, that even there doesn't have to be. Um, doesn't have to be the conflict. Um, yeah, I, I would say that there's a very healthy humility, to go back to our friend Thomas Aquinas, right, he once uh, said something to the effect that we as human beings cannot even exhaustively know the essence of a fly, right, to, to really enter into the full depth of being is to understand exhaustively the fount and source of all being, God, and we are not God. As Augustine said earlier, if uh, you comprehend it as an understand it exhaustively, it's not God, <laughs> right? It's an idol that you've created. So I think and agree that there's a profound humility uh, in, and there should be a profound humility. Uh, I think that there's a lot of room for us to, to relativize perspectives, right? I think about, especially the experience living in Rome, I see and am privileged to see so many different expressions of the faith different ways of dressing, different ways of singing, different ways of worshiping, different languages, different practices, different prayers. And some of it is really attractive and inspiring to me, and other of it seems a little bit weird to me, it doesn't really resonate. I say, okay, they're my brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, I think the, the, the big difference between us is that even though I'm willing to relativize a lot, and even though I'm willing to promote and recognize my need uh, for humility, our need for humility before the marvels of, of the created world and certainly before the Creator, uh, I think that there's still this capacity to at least arrive at convictions about fundamental truths that give an orientation. And I think that without that common orientation, without that common human nature, common virtues by which that human nature is fulfilled, no matter your economic status, no matter your color, no matter your background, no matter your size or your level of development, I think without that uniting element that we are doomed to a kind of unending conflict in which the stronger or the richer or whatever it may be triumph over the weaker and more vulnerable. Because if we are 
weaving different fictions and telling each other different stories, that's, that's fascinating, that's interesting. But when your story starts to say, therefore, we should destroy large quantities of embryos for some greater good of humanity, then our fictions start to deeply impact reality and they can even prevent other individuals from telling their stories, from sharing their fiction. So I don't think at all that your intention is to create this situation of conflict and violence, but I just find it difficult to see how we can avoid it in, in this particular perspective, which again is, is one perspective among many, right? And I don't want this to end up in, in a competition of humility. This is a society of the Olympics. Who can do the best? Well, then, because, then, Who can be humbler? Out your heart. Go! But in, in the end, sort of, really, that fictive ethics is actually, in the end, no. You might be right with everything you say. This is sort of the. This is the approach which goes along with the fictive ethics. Mm -hmm. In every encounter, one, one, no matter, and also if I talk to a Nigerian, mm -hmm. if I talk to a Chinese, I, it is sort of my, my, my self understanding that, you know, it is, I'm, I don't know whether I'm right. I've got my understandings, and, and on that hermeneutic basis, I'm aware of the contingency of how I arrived at that understanding. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a permanent discourse between you know, my genetically given, my upbringing, the environment, and so on. And, and on that basis, I acknowledge that the other one might be completely right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of a permanent self-relativizing stance concerning one's own norms and values. Mm -hmm. But as a consequence of that, um, th and this is why sort of the ethics of, 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 of liberal autonomy, liberal ethics of fictive autonomy, a liberal ethics of fictive autonomy is such a wonderful achievement. Sort of because we don't know, you know, what, what the ultimate answer, whether there is one or, um, and, and which one it is, it is, it is, it is the best possible, that's an as good as it gets solution to allow the greatest diversity of flourishing of different understandings from a legal perspective and political circumstances. And that would preclude any, any, any rigid judgment also concerning such issues at the beginning of life. Because in a, you can see in, in, a, in, a, in a political context, you see, well, if I look in, in, in if I consider the situation in Germany, you've got, you know, a third Catholics, a third well, thirty percent Catholic, thirty percent Protestant, thirty percent atheists, the rest uh, other religious forms, and and here, uh, how should we, how should we, and there's a, how should we come to any find of, of of conclusion, final conclusion on how to how to deal with this issue at the beginning of life, and and there's there's so many different understandings, and I I, I don't have a basis for saying this is one which ne necessarily has to be taken up by everyone. Mm -hmm. And there is so much uncertainty in particular in the beginning, in the very beginning, be it days, weeks, months, and, and there are so many different well-justified perspectives. Um, they might all be right. And as long as these individuals by themselves can justify can justify what they do, mm -hmm. um, also with other with fertilized eggs and so on. Then you know this this is sort of this humility which I think demands the openness to the others' uh, understanding. Well, Did Stefan, I, I think that uh, <laughs> it's clear <laughs> that there are diversities of perspectives and uh, and viewpoints here, but it has been such an absolute joy mm -hmm. to have this stimulating and worthwhile dialogue. And I honestly think it reflects very much your capacity for quality dialogue. And it's something that I've seen in you and the events that you've put on in your writing and your work. And, and I highly appreciate that. And I hope that this is not the last time you're on Those Two Priests. 
I hope that we can continue these conversations because as we both identified, transhumanism, posthumanism, these kind of hip, uh, sexy, cutting edge <laughs> topics actually bring us back to the oldest, most important questions. And so one episode is definitely not enough, but thank you for the, the excellent dialogue, for the new perspectives, for the ability to find common ground and the ability to have these clear disagreements and, and to do so in a respectful way because I think, at least you and I, I don't know about this guy, but you and I <laughs> want to improve humanity, right? No, we all want to improve humanity. We all want um, flourishing and human benefit and, and betterment. And so thank you for contributing to that with this dialogue and conversation. Normally, we end with a priestly blessing. We won't ask you <laughs> to, to give this priestly blessing to, to the audience. But, but can we say, for those who are watching, if you liked this type of conversation, which yes. I found stimulating, and so I, I want to echo those sentiments, we need more of this. The art of conversation is being lost. And where there's disagreement, but still a friendly back and forth, I think that is a healthy and much to be sought after thing. So you're you're a great example of that. So if you like that, please give us a like, subscribe, tell your friends, and share your comments because we're learning how to do this too along the way. So we really appreciate you having on the show today. But speaking of fictive ethics, I'm gonna make up one right now. I need <laughs> the value to create the value of a pizza dinner, Father, and yes. maybe uh, yes. something to eat. Which so, uh, Stefan will join us, us for. Please join us for that. <laughs> we will enhance ourselves <laughs> with uh, an agronomy of the time. <laughs> exactly. Thank right. you for being with us. We'll right. to get you back here on those two All right. Well, I'll give a final blessing. Oh, absolutely. This absolutely. will be a simple blessing this time. Okay. And thanks again to our guest, <laughs> Stefan. And by all means, look up. We have always been cyborgs and the other 120 books or so That's that it. you've written. So, all right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this dialogue. We thank you for this pursuit of human happiness and flourishing. We pray that all of us might be enlightened, that we might grow in humility between the marvels of this world and the marvels of your plan, and that we might deepen in authentic friendship to assist all of our brothers and sisters in this journey of flourishing. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you all and remain with you forever. Amen.